Welcome to our recorded service. I'm pleased you're able to join with us in this. We are still wondering when we're going to get back into church. From my point of view, one of the key things is when we will be able to join together in singing praise. I believe that singing is one of God's chosen components of our worship together. But this week I, I happen to read on the BBC website that there is an experiment going on uh, between a number of scientists and several churches where they're investigating how much uh, it is likely that singing will transmit uh, viruses and uh, there could be some good results from that. Let's hope that there are indeed. So we have to have people who sing by proxy for us. And once again, we're listening to the congregation of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London singing a great resurrection hymn, O oh, Praise the Risen Prince of Light.
Now join with me in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is so good for us to come and take time to be still in your presence and to know that you are God. You are the God who made us and made everything that we can see, can touch, can hear, can taste, everything that fills our world and far more beyond, for you are the Creator. You are the God to whom we come, giving you thanks for your gracious care of us, your tender mercies to us, your, your providing for our needs, your guarding and guiding us. The fact we are able to sit at this moment in the comfort of the place that we are and listen to your word is a testimony to your goodness to us. We thank you for all those things that we take for granted and then maybe at times such as this we realize they've been taken from us and we miss them. And we acknowledge that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. But above all, we want to thank you for that greatest of all gifts, your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you because through his life and work and words, we may know you better. We thank you that because of his obedience to your will and his love for us, we are forgiven not by our own efforts, but by his gracious offering of himself as a sacrifice. And we thank you that now you have raised him from the dead. In that resurrection we have the hope of everlasting life. And until the day comes when you call us to yourself, or when Jesus himself returns to take us to you, your Spirit is at work in our hearts, filling us with a love for you in our minds, opening your word that we might understand it better in the church, that you are leading your people forward. Heavenly Father, we confess our unworthiness of all your good gifts. There are things we have said and things we have done that are offensive to you, and we seek your pardon. And we seek your pardon too for all that we have left undone. Oh, how easy it is for us to make good intentions and to speak promising words and how we can fail. But Lord God, you are so merciful to us. You forgive us our sins. And we ask that you would turn us now. Give us a new mind, a new heart, a new will. That pressing on towards the goal of eternal life in Jesus Christ, we may be better able to worship and serve you in his name. Amen. Our reading Today is Acts chapter 14. We're pressing on with the story of the book of Acts. And in this re reading, uh, Paul and Barnabas visit several places and lots of different things happen to them. So reading from Acts chapter 14 at verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. 
There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to ill-treat them and stone them. But they found out about it, and fled to the Lycaonian cities of Lystra and Derbe, and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the gospel. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth, and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates, because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past he let all nations go their own way, Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered round him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day he and Barnabas left for Derbe. They preached the gospel in the city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From Italia they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Amen.
did you intend that I should face such anguish? Or do you watch my plight with unconcern? Yet I have no one else I can rely on. My God, my life, long hope to you I turn. When we come to this chapter, we, we, we find ourselves visiting lots of places. They've got strange names. Some of them exist, some of them don't uh, in our world. And uh, there seems to be a lot going on. And so rather than try and follow through verse by verse, I thought what we'd do is we'd, we'd address Luke in Acts and we'd say, ask him four questions and see how he answers those questions uh, from the pas passage that we read. So the first question is this, if you faithfully preach the gospel, can you be sure that people will believe the gospel that you preach? Now, I ask this because there are some, perhaps a lot of preachers who take the line that if you faithfully preach the word of God, if the, you have the, the, the gifts of communication that God has given you, then there will be no problem. People will come to faith. When, when I was in Hoyt, we had a minister who came to one of the churches and uh, he very boldly publicised uh, the view that as far as he was concerned, there were lots of Christians in all the different churches, but the ministers had failed abysmally because no one was being converted in Hoyk. And all it needed was for someone faithfully to preach the gospel and there would be dozens converted. I'm going to say no more than that it didn't happen the way he said. But if we have a more biblical approach to what happens when we preach the gospel. We see that there are different reactions. So, for example, uh, right at the beginning of our chapter, uh, Luke says, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. And that's fantastic. Someone preaches the gospel. They do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. They do it prayerfully, and many people believe. And then we're told at verse 21, they preached the gospel in that city, Derbe, and won a huge number of disciples. Again, a hugely positive reaction. But you can get an equally negative reaction to preaching the gospel. The people of the city, and were still in Iconium at this point, verses 4 and 5, of the chapter were divided. Oh, you see, it's not plain sailing. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. And so the point is we keep seeing and we keep have to recognizing that's presumably why the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to keep saying this, that the gospel is divisive. 
One commentator, William Hendrickson, said, The proclamation of the good news demands a positive response of joyful compliance. But a negative response demonstrates willful defiance. So, question two. If we could perform miracles, wouldn't that encourage people to believe? Well, again, the answer is not necessarily. In the chapter, we see two reactions to the miraculous. For some people, the miraculous confirmed the message they believed. And so we're told in verse 3 that the Lord continued the message of his grace by enabling Paul and Barnabas to perform signs and, mir and wonders. The miracles there had the effect of confirming the message and the messengers. But then you go to Lystra uh, and to this man who is lame. And I'm sure Luke chose this particular miracle to show that the the ministry of Paul and Barnabas was the same as the ministry of Peter. It was gospel ministry, apostolic in its nature, and that Peter and Paul were not ministering different gospels. So the man is healed. The man, I am sure, was delighted for that and was probably not interested in interested in any theological points that Luke was making. But look at the effect. Verses 11 and 12, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and but Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Uh, Zeus was sort of the head god, in the um, the pantheon of gods, and Hermes was the messenger of the gods. Uh, he delivered things. That's why the, the company that puts your parcels on your front doorstep is called Hermes. Anyway, this was completely the wrong result, <laughs> if you think strategically, because instead of believing the gospel, the miracle had the effect of reinforcing the false religion of the Lystrans, and Paul was horrified. He and Barnabas were told, tore their clothes. That, that showed that they were absolutely appalled at the reaction. And Paul himself, in reflecting, regards signs and wonders of not wholly good effect amongst people. To the Corinthians, who were very much into signs and wonders, he wrote, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now it is undoubted that there is a great deal of the miraculous going on in Acts, and it has a theological significance in Acts. But it should not be seen as some sort of big juju that will impress the unbelievers. Paul himself, you see, insisted that faith comes through the proclam proclamation of the word and not the performing of supernatural magic. And so as we look at the, the miracles that took place, undoubtedly for those who, like the layman, were blessed by what happened. They had cause, cause to praise and to thank God. But in terms of convincing people that the gospel is true, well, Paul himself 
whom God used to work this wonder, recognized that it was only partial at the best. Okay, so the third question we want to ask Luke. We say, well, we've now seen a good number of sermons addressed to Jewish audiences in Acts, and now we've got a sort of half sermon where Paul is speaking exclusively to Gentiles. Is there a difference between these? Now, I say it's a half sermon because uh, the way it's written by Luke looks as though it's cut off pretty abruptly, and what was going on suggests that uh, Paul couldn't complete all that he said. Now, you remember I said that in apostolic preaching, uh, there has to be a, a something of a common starting point between the preacher and his hearers in order to build this bridge over between the, the world of the here and now and the world of God's revelation of himself. And for the Jewish audiences, the, the starting point was always an easy one because the context of his preaching was always in worship and there was the Old Testament which they had in common. But with non-Jews, he needs a, a different starting point, one that he and his hearers have in common. And there is one. It is creation. And the amazing thing is, that is still for us a common starting point with people who know nothing of the Bible. You see, I think for a lot of uh, non-believers, if we open the Bible and we start quoting a verse to them, particularly if we start quoting something uh, from the, the Old Testament, like um, all their righteousness being as filthy rags, they don't know what we're talking about. But creation is very much at the top of people's thinking nowadays call it the environment, but it's the same thing. Uh, and so he addresses that, he says, verses uh, 15 onwards, we are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things, that's the pagan gods, to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past he let all nations go his own way. Yet he's not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness to you by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Now we can split that little bit of a sermon that we've got there up. We are bringing you good news the gospel. Let's always, in our witnessing, begin with good news. There is, for the sinner, bad news in the gospel message, but there is also good news. So he begins straight away by saying he is there, not a, a, as representing someone in a competition between different gods, but to bring good news. Telling you, he goes on, to turn from these worthless things to the living God. In other words, like all his other preaching, it demands a response. I want to put my hands up here and say that I believe my ministry has been marked by amongst all its failures, the consistent failure sufficiently to demand a response from people. Instead, I think we ministers tend to be sort of passively, aggressively naggy to people. But here, Paul sets the example for us, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God. That's what I'm here to say. What you believe in at the moment is worthless. What we're offering you is of infinite value. He goes on, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In other words, he is introducing them 
to the biblical doctrine of creation, which is not that everything just happened, or that different gods have different responsibilities for different parts of the world we can see, but that there is one God, and he is creator of all things. And then he goes on to talk about his God's relationship with the people he has made. He says, in the past, he let all nations go their own way. That is to say, he created human beings with what I'm going to call free moral agency. I think that's better than free will, because the trouble with our will is our will is terribly tied up with our natures, and our natures as sinful often express a sinful will. So we are free moral agents. We decide what we're going to do. But our will is not always free from corruption. He goes on, yet he's not left himself without testimony. He's introducing them to the idea that God reveals himself. He's a God who speaks. He doesn't like the other gods, send Hermes along with a message. God is a God who has consistently spoken of himself. And if you want to hear what God says, you've got to go and read the Bible. And then he says, He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fill your hearts with joy. So here is God's purpose. He is declaring to these pagans, these people who believe in other non-gods. But the way he presents God's goodness, God's loving kindness, the good news of the gospel, is appropriate to them. Now he's obviously quoting scripture but he's not doing it directly, as he would with a Jew. With a Jew, he could quote a passage from Isaiah. And most adult Jews in his congregation would have learned that by memory. And yet his sermon is still full of biblical themes, and he presents them with a view to getting a response. But Lystra is not the best place for an example of preaching to non-Jews because their understanding is huge and it focuses particularly on who they think that Paul and Barnabas are. And so we'll actually have to see later on in Acts an example of a, a bigger um, sermon and a better response to it. Last question. Question four. Isn't what Paul and Barnabas did just hit and run evangelism? We are, I believe rightly, suspicious of hit and run evangelism. Those who, maybe not so much nowadays, but still to an extent, rock up in a place and either by individually witnessing on the street or by organising meetings or whatever, come along, uh, bash people with the gospel, and then disappear forever. Um, I, I tell a story um, often because it, it, it illustrates this hit and run evangelism. When I lived and worked in Glasgow, uh, when I did what people refer to as a real job, um, when I lived and worked in Glasgow, uh, on my way to work, walking from the station to the workplace, I walked past a man who was very often there, and he wore a sandwich board. Um, and the front of the sandwich board had on it, the wages of sin is death. That's just what you wanted to see at quarter to nine on a workday morning. And as you went past him on the back of his sandwich, board he had be sure your sins will find you out and one day in the crowd I couldn't do what most people were doing and that is make a beeline around him 
I found myself confronted by him. And he looked at me and he said, are you saved? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, do you know what that means? I said, yes, I do. He said, how do you know you are? I said, because Jesus died for my sins. Ah, oh, but have you committed your life to Jesus? Yes, I have. And I thought, this interrogation is not what I want. I'm going to be late for work. And I said, look, I'm sorry. I don't want to be rude, but I haven't got time to talk with you there. He said, well, make sure you read what it says on the back of the boards. Your sins will find you out. And I thought, this is no good. This hit and run evangelism. Now, this is what not, not what happened with the apostles. Verses 21 to 23. Then Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, to Iconium, to Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas anointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. See what they did? They went back to encourage the people who had believed what they'd been preaching, who had come to faith or who were actively pursuing an understanding. They were pastorally wise. Those who had been converted, like all new converts, in the first flush of enthusiasm, they think that everything about the gospel is just so wonderful. And he says, yes, everything about the gospel is wonderful, but we may face difficult trials. And he also appoints elders. You know, Paul holds the office of elder in such very high esteem. And to choose elders is something that requires great prayerfulness. And the elders have to be dedicated to the Lord, not in, only in themselves, but the church has to dedicate them to the Lord because the church doesn't belong to anyone. The church does not belong to the members. When members talk about my church, they are making a claim they do not have. The church does not belong to the Kirk session. The church does not belong to the denomination. The church belongs to God. And he bought the church with the life of his son. And therefore Paul isn't a hit and run evangelist, but he goes back. He encourages and builds up and warns and, and teaches that they have started on a journey that may be rough and steep and may be difficult and trying. But he chooses the very best people from the fellowship and says to them, you look after them. They are God's people in this town. God chose them to be salt and light. And now you, the elders, have got to nurture them and care for them. May these snapshots of Paul's missionary life and the church's life as it came into being in these various towns and cities be an encouragement to us in our work and witness. We're going to listen to another song.
Now join with me again in prayer. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, we come again in the name of Jesus, praising you and thanking you that we can in quietness come and offer to you our cares and concerns, our prayers and our petitions in the knowledge that you hear us because you are the God who offers yourself to us in prayer and answers our prayers because you are gracious and merciful and because this way of access has been made for us. And so we come and we pray, first of all, for the church. And again and again, as we read the book of Acts, and we look at the power of the gospel and the working of the spirit and the conviction of the apostles and the growth of the church, we can so easily become disheartened. We are fearful of the disease that rampages round the world. We are limited in our boldness to make the gospel known. We are possessive of what we think of as being our church and our traditions. And we are ambitious to be bigger, better, brighter and more popular 
than others. Lord, be merciful to us and be graciously pleased to use this time so to form and reform our thinking that when we return to what we call normal or when we discover the new things you want us to do, we may be bold in witness. We thank you, Father, that throughout the world your church is bringing many to faith. And we rejoice in that and praise you for it. But we remember that as faith comes, so do trials and troubles come. And we pray for the church where it struggles and for your people where they suffer. We pray for the world. Lord God, you call men and women to positions of high office. And their calling to govern is like all your callings, a holy one and a responsible one. And we pray for those who govern, that they may have the humility to be governed by you first. We pray for those who exercise great power and we cannot help but pray for Donald Trump at this time. And we pray for all our leaders who work in our parliaments that they may work wisely in what they do and give good and clear and godly leadership. We pray for our community, for our friends, our neighbours, other members of our family. And as we pray for them, we pray for people who have so many different needs, that those who, who are burdened by work or care, those who are empty because they have neither to involve them, those who face death, those who are bereaved, those who are rejoicing, those who are in new situations they haven't chosen for themselves or new experiences they find difficult to process. And in the quiet, we think of those who have shared with us their cares and concerns, and we bring them to you now. And we pray for ourselves. Lord, you made us. You know us. Do for us as we need and as you in your mercy will do. All these prayers we bring to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Both our hymns sung by the Metropolitan Tabernacle, the first hymn and the last hymn in this broadcast, were by Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts was born in Northampton. He is often described as the father of nonconformists. His father, uh, was called Isaac, uh, also was a nonconformist minister and was twice imprisoned uh, for being a nonconformist. Um, not to be an Anglican was a dangerous thing for a while in England. Watts Jr., because he was a nonconformist, couldn't go to Oxford or Cambridge universities because they were only for Anglicans. Uh, but there was a, a university college uh, for nonconformists, and he went there and he learned theology and logic, and he was a man of great intellect, a very, very powerful scholar at school. He learned three languages and was fluent in them, and he, after graduation, became a pastor, but not for long, because in his thirties uh, his health failed. And so the rest of his life he was spent as a 
tutor to a big family and he wrote a lot of books, um, books on reason and uh, books on theology. But we know the name of Isaac Watts for his hymns, the father of English hymnody. He had this great understanding that the Psalms were not just Jewish hymns of the past, but they were Christian too. And I think the greatest service he gave us was, was not in writing new hymns, but he did and they were good and we still sing a lot of those hymns and they are popular hymns but he when paraphrasing the old testament psalms for singing in church in metrical form very often added a new testament understanding he 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 got at a, a tremendously deep level that the new testament is the fulfillment of the old it's a little story about Isaac Watts. He learned how to make rhymes from a very early age. And one day at family prayers, he didn't have his eyes closed and his head bowed. He was doing what children do during family prayers. He was looking around. And his father said to him, Why did you have your eyes open? And he said, A little mouse, for want of stairs, ran up a rope to say his prayers. Well, that was very clever, Isaac, uh, but it did mean that Isaac got his backside tanned for his pains. And he, he must have been quite a precocious child, said, Oh, Father, Father, pity take, I will no more verses make. Like a lot of childish promises, he didn't keep that one. And that is great. And so we're going to end with one of his great hymns, I'll praise my maker while I've breath. Till we're able to meet again, may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you.